Today I'm going to talk about, uh, well, the definitions that we thought about in our paper for the quality criteria of memory images or snapshots. So these terms will be used interchangeably. And a small warning, this is going to be way more theoretical than we just heard, but I'm going to try and keep it uh, not uh, too mathematical. So the motivation for this topic um, is best understood if we look at the topic of main memory analysis. So when we analyze main memory images, we often want to know many things like which kinds of processes are there, what is in the process memory and open network connections. And uh, for this uh, information, we rely on um, data structures that are used um, by the operating system. So in the case of the Linux kernel, for example, there's the task list. And well, this is all great if we have consistent data structures, but oftentimes uh, main memory images ca cannot be taken in a system that is in a frozen state. So while the image is taken, we have uh, concurrent processes that make changes to the memory. And one effect of this is that maybe many people have heard about is uh, page smearing. So we get inconsistencies between the uh, entries in the page tables and the actual contents in the page frames. Uh, a simplified um, example can be seen here, where we have two memory regions, R1 and R2, um, on the y-axis and the progression of time on the x-axis. And um, so our memory acquisition process starts and first acquires this first region here in the orange square. And then due to concurrent activity, our acquisition process doesn't continue, some other things happen, and suddenly we get a new list element, for example, in our task list, and a pointer to this new element. And now we acquire um, the second region that contains the pointer to the list element, and this uh, means that in our memory image, we have an inconsistent state with a pointer for like a, a next pointer, for example, pointing to me a memory region with, well, random memory or something like an older list element. So this is a state that's not, um, that has never existed like this. And uh, because this issue is known, people have been thinking about, yeah, what is, what makes the, what defines the quality of a memory image, especially in situations where we can't freeze the system. And uh, 10 years ago, Fümmel and Freiling came up with, with uh, three quality criteria, namely atomicity, correctness, and integrity. And uh, well, in briefly, atomicity tries to look at uh, the influence of concurrent activity on the quality of the memory image. Uh, correctness just asks, is the acquisition process actually working correctly? Is everything that is there copied? And are all values copied correctly? And then integrity, uh, the last one, um, tries to capture to which degree um, the uh, memory acquisition program itself influence the memory contents. Uh, a few years later, more recently, Pagani and others, they criticized especially atomicity for being difficult to evaluate in practice, and instead uh, suggested another um, criterion which they call time consistency, because they also think that these inconsistencies um, during the memory acquisition process um, are a big problem, and influence uh, the quality of the memory analysis to a high degree. And uh, so instead of um, focusing on the concurrent activity uh, or on the causal relationships as with the criterion of atomicity, uh, they said uh, that um, with time consistency, uh, we actually have to look at if um, the contents in our memory image were coexistent like this um, in memory at a point in time. So if there could have been an instantaneous snapshot that would have returned the same contents. And uh, in the following, so this motivated us to think anew about these criteria that Firmin and Freiling uh, formulated and also maybe in integrate uh, this concept of time consistency into the formalizations. Um, because we think that this abstract way of thinking about the issue might help to identify um, interesting ways to evaluate the quality of uh, memory acquisition tools. And in the following, I'm going to first talk about this concept of atomicity and then about integrity and how they are interconnected with each other. So another, for this, we actually need to have 
well, a model and a way to visualize memory. And the model that was used by Fögel and Freiling is influenced from concepts of distributed computing. So what we can see here are two memory regions, like in the example at the beginning, R1 and R2, and the arrows denote how they change over time. And uh, the contents of memory regions are changed by processes. We see P1 and P2 in this example. And each time a process accesses a memory region, for example, with a read or a write, uh, this uh, is denoted as an event. And events are ordered, obviously, by time. So in R2, we see that E2 happened before E3. But there's a different connection as well, namely when the process first accesses one region and then another, like here, between E1 and E3. And this uh, happened before relation is actually also uh, a causal relationship, or at least a potential causal relationship, where we say it could have been that E1 is actually the cause of this event E3. And uh, these kinds of errors become interesting later for atomicity. Um, but how does it look like when we take a snapshot of such in our model? So a memory snapshot or memory image um, is uh, a cut through the space-time diagram. So that's what I was talking about. Um, and so here we see our cut as this uh, orange line. And everything to the left of the cut, um, from its point of view, lies in the past, while everything to the right lies in the future. Um, and this will, so these um, space-time diagrams will now keep us company for the remainder of this talk. So let's uh, first look at as atomicity, or in a more general term, consistency. So the ideal case can be seen here. We have um, our two memory regions, and we take the snapshot at exactly the same time. Um, for the model, uh, this um, acquisition process needs to not only acquire the memory contents, but also the time at which um, the contents were acquired. So in this ideal snapshot, for both memory regions, the um, save time will be the same. But as we already thought about, um, it's often not the case that we can ach uh, achieve this, um, ideal, uh, these ideal circumstances. Instead, um, it might take some time to take the snapshot. So here we see that region one is um, copied earlier than region two. And um, so what uh, Fögel and Freiling called atomicity could also be called causal consistency because the uh, deciding um, factor is if these causal relationships, like here between E1 and E2, are uh, completely part of the snapshot. So if for every effect or possible effect, we contain the um, uh, possible cause. Um, so here everything is okay because we have um, the effect E1 and the cause E2. But um, in this example, um, we see a snapshot that is not atomic. Uh, here, we first uh, acquire region one, then event E1 happens, then event E2, and then region two is acquired. Again, this could happen because of concurrent activity or uh, in a more realistic example, there might be many memory regions in between. So it just takes some time until we get to the um, causally connected memory region. And uh, what we have here in this example is that uh, this event E1 is in the future from the perspective of the uh, snapshot or memory image. And E2 lies in the past. So now we have um, the situation that an event that happened in the future or happens is going to happen in the future from the perspective of the snapshot influenced influences an event that has happened in the past. And this can uh, have consequences like what we saw in the beginning. Imagine if E1 was um, actually adding a new list element and E2 was uh, changing an existing pointer to point to this list element, we would um, be missing this connection. And in the worst case, we could get um, a pointer to a, a wrong list element or otherwise um, confusing value. So this is one way to think about it, this uh, causal, causal uh, model. Uh, another way 
is to think about which kinds of memory contents were coexistent in memory at a certain point in time. So this is what we call quasi-instantaneous consistency. Instead of looking at causal dependencies between processes, we try to see when, or events, we try to see when were the memory contents coexistent in memory. In this example, the snapshot, uh, first uh, copies um, R2 and then R1. And in between we have two events that happen, E1 and E2. And if we now try to see if the snapshot is quasi-instantaneously consistent, we have to search for a point in time where an instantaneous snapshot, so one that is taken while the system is frozen, would have produced the same results. And in this example, this could be this uh, gray line here. So how does this look like if the snapshot isn't consistent? So here, uh, we also first acquire region two and then region one, but the, uh, um, the order in which the uh, but um, the problem is that while um, event E1 happens after region two has been already copied, then event E2 happens and then region one is copied. So at least in the time frame that we are observing, there isn't any state at which uh, the memory contents caused by this event E2 were coexistent to memory contents uh, where E1 ha hasn't happened yet. Therefore, we get a violation, and this could be again uh, could again result in something like this list inconsistency, where we are missing a link or um, seeing wrong links in the end. So these are our consistency definitions, and they are also connected to each other. So one unsurprising thing is that instantaneous consistency implies both quasi-instantaneous consistency as well as causal consistency. Um, this is because if we freeze the system and take the memory snapshot, copy every region at the same time, then we know that the point in time at which an instantaneous snapshot would have produced the same result is exactly that point in time. And if we have this um, vertical line, there can also be no arrows from the future into the past. Uh, what is more interesting is the relationship between quasi-instantaneous consistency and um, causal consistency. Um, so here we see an example of a snapshot that is atomic but not quasi-instantaneous. Um, it's a really simple example because it needs to be atomic as there are no um, causal relationships between E1 and E2. So um, from in the, for the causal effects, uh, the both, both processes are concurrent to each other. But it's the same example that we saw earlier for a not uh, quasi-instantaneous snapshot. Uh, we, we cannot find an hypo a hypothetical uh, instantaneous snapshot that would have produced the same result it was, as what we see in our snapshot. Uh, but what about the other way around? Is every quasi-instantaneous snapshot also causally consistent? Mm, for this, we need to think about something that I have mostly uh, ignored so far. Um, events can be read or write events. And when we define these, when we think about these implications between the definitions, we also need to uh, first think about which kinds of events we are observing or we want to observe. Uh, in this example, if E1 is only a read access, the snapshot is not causally consistent because um, the cause of E2 is missing, but it's still uh, quasi-instantaneously consistent if the event doesn't change the memory contents because then we can find a uh, hypothetical instantaneous snapshot that would have produced the same results from the content. So this is, for example, the gray line here. If we say that we are only observing modifying events, then uh, the situation changes. In this case, uh, if E1 um, happens, then the snapshot is neither causally consistent nor uh, quasi-instantaneously consistent. So we know that every, uh, every time this such a, such a, a cause is missing, we will um, actually uh, observe this when we try to search for the hypothetical instantaneous snapshot. There's just one limitation to this. Um, we also need to be sure 
that after, in the example E2 has happened, there are no um, further events that change the memory contents back to the original state of R1. Because in this case, we, would, we could possibly miss um, the connection the, that the causal consistency isn't uh, achieved anymore. All right, so now we have been thinking a lot about consistency. Let's uh, change focus a bit and uh, move on to integrity. So, as I said, consistency is mostly about the influence of concurrent activity on the snapshot contents. Um, uh, in the case of integrity, on the other hand, we need to think about the influence of the acquisition program on the memory contents. Fimmel and Freiling uh, defined integrity uh, with, re with respect to a point in time tau. This could, for example, be the time at which the acquisition program is started. Um, and to put it simply, they said, between tau and the acquisition of each memory region, no events are allowed to happen. So if this event E1, or no modifying events are allowed to happen. If E1 here happened, then this snapshot wouldn't satisfy integrity anymore. We call this restrictive integrity because it doesn't allow for any modifications to occur. But we thought that there might be uh, use cases for a more relaxed um, definition. Uh, it's still um, with uh, respect to a point in time tau, uh, but we said modifications are allowed as long as in the end, when the contents of the memory region are acquired, um, the original contents that were existent in memory at this point in time tau are copied. Um, seems maybe a little bit arbitrary, but there we could think about cases in which we acquire the memory from an outside source but can still not freeze the system. So if we operate at a higher privilege level than the operating system, this could be possible that we have to change parts of memory, but that we also have the ability to change them back before they are acquired. Um, the integrity definitions as well um, are connected to each other. This is also one um, obvious thing to see that restrictive integrity implies permissive integrity. Because if no values at all are allowed to change in the memory contents, then we also know that we are actually acquiring um, the contents that were existent in memory at time tau. Um, then there's another uh, implication, namely between integrity and correctness. So I haven't talked about correctness today, uh, but it's uh, we can still um, get to understanding this because um, the integrity definitions both um, com compare the snapshot contents to the actual memory contents. So um, if our acquisition program would be working incorrectly and maybe not acquiring all memory regions or uh, always acquiring ones when there are zeros, um, we would never uh, evaluate the snapshot to satisfy integrity, and therefore we can uh, just uh, evaluate integrity and not have a special evaluation for correctness. Uh, so lastly, um, integrity and consistency um, are also related to each other. And let's first have a look at the relation between integrity and quasi-instantaneous consistency. Uh, here we see a snapshot that is uh, quasi-instantaneously consistent because we can find a point in time at which the memory contents were coexistent, like this in memory, for example, here, the gray line. But uh, assuming that these events actually change the memory contents, uh, integrity isn't satisfied with respect to tau. Uh, so not every quasi-instantaneously consistent snapshot also satisfies integrity. However, the other way around, um, we actually have an implication. So if we know that a snapshot satisfies integrity, then we know that it has to be at least quasi-instantaneously consistent. Because with both um, integrity definitions, we know that the acquired values are those that were existent in memory at uh, time tau. So uh, this would be our gray line that we are searching, our hypothetical instantaneous snapshot um, for having uh, the same memory contents in our snapshot than like a hypothetical instantaneous snapshot would have looked like. So we get this implication here. 
as I said, uh, the implication between quasi-instantaneous consistency and causal consistency is kind of limited by what kind of events are observed. So we cannot say that every time that because of this we also have the implication between integrity and causal consistency only if we apply the limitation. Uh, there is another uh, connection. Restrictive integrity implies causal consistency if we are only observing um, modifying events without any further limitations because if no event at all happens, then we can also not get um, uh, missing causes of effects. So in the end, this leads us to this big picture. Uh, what becomes clear by looking at this is that it's really difficult to uh, define consistency completely uh, independent of integrity, which might be a weakness. Um, and also that if we can uh, evaluate integrity, we don't have to um, independently also evaluate correctness. Okay, so this was like the main definitions uh, that we thought about. Um, of course, uh, now that we have like continued or worked a while in this abstract theoretical realm, it would be interesting to move a little bit more to the real world again. And um, so as future work, we would like to actually perform practical tool evaluations with um, the two um, consistency definitions, causal consistency and quasi-instantaneous consistency and um, maybe also have another look at integrity um, because uh, yeah, um, prior uh, investigations into this um, maybe could be improved. So thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take any questions if you have some. Thank you very much. So are there any questions? in the audience or in the chat? Yes, there is one. Thank you for your presentation and a good explanation about integrity. Uh, I was wondering uh, if you take into account what I think is like inverse proportional relation between relevance and volatility. So typically things that change a lot are forensically not that relevant. So how do you see that? Um, you mean, sorry. <laughs> well, if it traces only in memory for, let's say, microseconds, typically I find it's not that relevant in the scale of user activity that's more about chats or killing or theft. So the relevancy of very short existing traces uh, in the scope of uh, acquisition uh, is limited, so yeah. I wonder what your views are on that. I think that's true. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this was mainly like an abstracted view on these uh, concepts, uh, but still I think it's interesting to understand what's happening, to understand what, um, if you have only a few seconds to take a memory image, what can you get, how likely is it that you will have a memory snapshot that you can actually work with, that you can analyze well, and maybe also what can you do to increase the quality of the memory snapshot. And I would like to talk about this more if you are interested as well later. Okay, another question. Then actually, I do have another one. You talk about the idea of making some practical tool evaluation. Do you already have a plan like how to proceed with this? Uh, kind of. So we have been discussing quite a bit about this because uh, especially in the case of atomicity, it is kind of difficult. Like if you think about these uh, causal relationships, uh, you can't really track all processes of one system, like a, at least a realistic one, and see how they interact with all the memory regions and how you get these connections. It is possible, but it takes a lot of time, I think. So um, we have been thinking about maybe taking only a part of the system, so focusing on a certain part of the operating system um, memory, or maybe um, moving this to some kind of test program where we control everything and then we can do some uh, uh, test runs where we try to evaluate how many inconsistencies do we get in this small part 
and then try to connect this um, to other inconsistency indicators like when we try to use volatility and we see, oh, the process list is inconsistent with another uh, source of getting how many processes were running, for example. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, there is another question. Um, thank you for that. Um, are there any, have you done any research into a targeted acquisition of areas of memory rather than doing a linear acquisition of starting at zero and going to the end? Is there any benefit to jumping around within memory to, to image parts of it to gain atomicity? So we didn't do any research in this uh, or experience in this direction, but um, the um, Pagani and others in this paper I mentioned, they uh, suggested uh, instead of performing this linear analysis to start with memory areas where we know they are important. So for example, uh, the kernel memory where this, these process lists and everything are um, located and then continuing with the rest of the address space. So kind of yeah, starting with the important things and then continuing. So I think that's a good idea and should help quite a bit. Okay, there's another one. Yes, give me a second. So, hello, hi. So th there is a lot going on in the memory when you try to acquire uh, a memory image. So how do you identify the events like that causing inconsistency or, uh, because there could be a lot of events going on, right? Uh, during, so, uh, will you create a profile or something, or uh, how that would look like to identify that, okay, if this is happened, then it's, uh, the integrity breaks, or if this isn't happened? So you mean like um, trying to define, define situations that make certain types of inconsistency more likely? I think that's an interesting idea. I'm not exactly sure at the moment how we would go about doing this, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah because uh, it's about how do you measure all these different properties, right? And yeah. if you cannot identify the events and then when they happen and whether it's inconsistent, uh, then measuring those uh, properties would be very hard. Yeah. In practical, right? Yeah. So, it is actually the problem when you Think about, for example, these process list inconsistencies. You can theoretically also get them in a frozen system because if you get the wrong time, then the operating system might be just changing something. And then you also get a pointer that is pointing to, well, not unhelpful data or um, old data. Uh, so maybe it makes sense to work with a virtualized environment and also compare an instant an actually instantaneous snapshot to the one acquired over time to see, um, to get an idea about this. Yeah, but I think it's an interesting topic to think about and yeah, maybe we can talk about it a little bit more later. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we will now start our next coffee break. We will meet again at half past three in this room on virtual. See you then. Thank you. Thank you.